For three days early this month, leaders from African countries as well as thought leaders, they met here in Nairobi to deliberate on the course of action to deal with climate change, which is impacting the continent severely. And at the end of the conversation, a document dubbed the, Nilo the Nairobi Declaration uh, was crafted. It's a 65-point document. And on this show, we're going to look at those critical documents and, of course, hi highlight some of the areas that we feel um, needs critical attention. You're watching the uh, Base Check. We are live from Broadcasting House. My name is O'Brien Kimani. And later on, we shall be looking at the state of our economy, from high fuel prices to inflation, and of course, to the global geopolitics, what is affecting the Kenyan economy severely? That is a conversation that we shall be having here. But before then, remember, we have our reporters on the ground. They are tracking what's happening. And of course, we shall be having some links just to get a feel of the items that we are following up today. We are live from Broadcasting House. My name is O'Brien Kimani. At O'Brien Kimani is my Twitter handle. And we have Charles Mwangi. He's a head of, prog he's a head of programs at the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance. He's joining us this morning. He was part of the conversation at the African Climate uh, Summit at Kenyatta International Convention Center. Uh, he has participated in, other, in, in many other forums around the world on climate change. And so when he speaks... You definitely know he's an authority on matters of climate change. He's going to guide us in this conversation. He's going to share his experience at the conference, the heat and the misses, and of course, the way forward. And also remember, world leaders are meeting in New York for the annual uh, United Nations General uh, Assembly meeting. Of course, yesterday there was a bit of firework um, pitting the Russian Federation against uh, the Ukrainian government. And we'll be telling you what exactly transpired there and why, uh, you know, call for a ceasefire in that region is growing. Well, let's now get into the conversation. Today, we just want to track the Nairobi Declaration, um, clim uh, Climate ch uh, Change Declaration, and of course, the call to action. Charles Mwangi, as I told you, is the head of uh, programs at Pan-African Climate Justice. He's joining us this morning to help us in this conversation. Charles, thank you so very much indeed for your time. I, uh, first of all, want to hear from you. I mean, you, 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 you were there you witnessed, you saw what has hap what happened uh, within those three days. I want to hear, what was your thought about the Climate Summit? Thank you so much, O'Brien, and I'm happy to uh, come back again. Um, I want to begin by mentioning that uh, the summit in itself was a good thing. In fact, the decision by the African heads of state to actually host this particular summit in itself was a good idea. Mm -hmm. And it's an idea that should have come much, much earlier. Because we have always said that it's important for the African, you know, continent, you know, for the African continent to speak as one, to speak in one voice, yep. you know, because matters and issues that are affecting us, particularly on climate change, really, are homogeneous across the continent. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we need to come up with a, a position, an African position, really, on how um, we need to take this uh, discourse and conversation around climate change. So that was a good thing, and we were privileged as Kenya to host this um, uh, summit, pretty much because our president really... Uh, has been the chair um, of the uh, uh, African Union Heads of State uh, Committee, you know, on um, uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. So we got that opportunity. And the good thing is that um, there's a decision now uh, or a commitment by the African leaders to make this summit a biannual event. Yes. So that this is not an end in itself, uh, but it's just but the beginning, uh, so that we can be able to have uh, several other um, uh, events, you know, uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe just to also mention that, um, of course, we had our own uh, concerns around this uh, summit. Of course, being the inaugural summit, we expected um, there could be a few issues here and there. We raised those issues as non-state actors, and we really felt that this needed to be a very, very inclusive process, you know, where all stakeholders are involved, including especially the communities at the front line of climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking of the indigenous people. I'm talking of communities living in uh, marginalized, you know, uh, regions, the arid and semi-arid regions. Mm -hmm. I'm talking of the women constituency, you know, uh, religious community, farmers, and so on and so forth. And, of course, we did engage the organizers of this particular summit. At the end of the day, 
you know that inclusion really was um, uh, achieved mm -hmm. we were able to uh, have all these constituencies on the table and to contribute you know to the conversation uh, around um, uh, uh, matters climate change in Africa mm -hmm. Very well. And, 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 and I want now to hear from you. I mean, even before, you, you know, the conference uh, kicked off, I mean, there were concerns by uh, non-state actors uh, that, uh, you know, there was no proper consultation and uh, they were calling for, 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 for more consultations uh, to ensure that uh, the, 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 the interest of all Africans, you know, is captured in that conference. Um, w w was that factored? Yeah, when a decision was arrived at that we needed to have this summit and it was agreed that this would happen in Nairobi in September, as non-state actors, we formed a committee that we, we were calling uh, at the time, um, uh, the non-state actors steering committee. And the reason as to why that committee was formed is so that we can also be able to give our technical expertise in, in forming this process. Because even though this was a government or member states, you know, um, uh, an AU, you know, uh, kind of a process, but we felt it needed, you know, to reflect the needs of the African people. Mm -hmm. And we felt we needed to guard that jealousy uh, so that um, we are able to get an output that really speaks to the felt needs of the, of the community. So we engaged uh, the government uh, officials uh, and the organizers, including the African Union, mm -hmm. uh, in many fronts. Uh, and at the end of the day, at least, we uh, were hard to uh, quite some extent. I saw that our voices was heard. We had representation even in the opening you know, you know, session of that particular summit. Yeah. And uh, the issues that we raised, uh, some of them were captured, some of them were not. And I think we're going to unpack probably some of the issues that we felt mm -hmm. were uh, adequately uh, addressed. Mm -hmm. But we also uh, look at those ones that we felt probably uh, would have done better mm -hmm. in terms of really uh, putting them to... And that's where I want us to start. Let's first of all look at the issues that you feel uh, were adequately addressed mm -hmm. and captured during that meeting. Um, mm -hmm. How do you rank them? One, I would say, you know, the unity of the African people and the African government is perhaps one of the biggest things we probably achieved within this particular summit. At least, we saw our leaders, you know, at the very high level, you know, the presidents, you know, coming together mm -hmm. to discuss the climate change agenda and not any other agenda. And one thing that we also probably managed uh, uh, to achieve within the uh, conference is to ensure that we raise the profile of this climate change discourse from it just being an environmental issue, the way people have always perceived it. And we have been able to show that it's actually a developmental issue. And therefore, you realize most of the issues that were being, you know, conversed and discussed within uh, that particular summit were developmental issues. But we're also very, very careful, you know, to avoid a situation whereby this would be turned into a business summit. Mm -hmm. We needed to look at the critical issues affecting uh, the common frontline communities and ensure that we have uh, procedures and we have come up with at least with uh, some uh, recommendations in terms of how we move forward. Uh, at least the declaration is there, but one thing that is lacking is a mechanism, you know, to ensure uh, that we are able to make a proper follow-up, you know, of the recommendations. We needed to see our leaders being more assertive in terms of this is the roadmap we are going to use, you know, in, our, in order for us to be able to achieve, you know, the aspirations of our people, you know, as uh, uh, stipulated within the 65, you know, uh, uh, point document. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you are raising something that... Um uh, uh, you know, a lot of people are, are, are also, uh, um, you know, raising that, um, you know, then how do we make the Nairobi Declaration not to be just another document, you know, drafted after uh, meetings of um, uh, 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 big cuts? And, and how do we then ensure that this document is alive and it is worked on? And, and, and so that is still now the big question. And, and how, how, would, how would you propose this to happen? Well, uh, like I did mention, you know, we have had many conferences, including what we call the Conference of, of Parties. And mm -hmm. now we have the 28th conference happening in Dubai in mm -hmm. the next uh, few months. Um, and one of the problems is that uh, we always get a lot of commitments in most of these particular meetings. And very good speeches. Uh, but beyond that, we don't see those uh, actions, you know, actually being implemented. You know, those good recommendations, those good points that are, that are raised, we don't see, you know, sometimes you know, implementation of the same. And that is our biggest fear, you know, with this particular declaration. We have a declaration. We have read it out. Our president is actually uh, uh, at UNGA, United Nations uh, General uh, Assembly, you know, in, in New York. And, and, and he's already articulating some of the issues and outputs of this particular uh, document. But how can we be able to come together and really come up with a clear action plan that this is the roadmap you're going to follow? There are several things that uh, were good in that particular document. One of them, of course, 
uh, the declaration we organized and quoted actually uh, the IPCC, the Governmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, six assessment report, mm -hmm. which clearly indicates that Africa really is warming you know, beyond um, uh, or, or faster than other uh, regions in the world. Mm -hmm. And that Africa, of course, is experiencing, you know, uh, the, the most impacts of adv uh, adverse impacts of climate change. And that we need to, of course, um, uh, act very quickly. And it indicated, uh, actually called upon the developed country partners to honor their commitments, particularly making reference to the 100 billion, you know, dollar commitment per year, which was done about 14 years ago, and where we have not even seen, you know, the products of the same. They recognize, of course, the issue of frozen damage and that we need to really focus on how we address that particular question and how, of course, we fund, you know, that particular facility. You know, there was a call, of course, um, uh, to also ensure that um, we are reducing, of course, consumption of fossil fuels, but also uh, facing out, you know, or facing down, you know, uh, coal. Although we felt that probably that could have been much stronger, so that we talk about facing out and not just facing down, you know, uh, that the energy like coal. Uh, some of those issues are good. And, of course, the issue of reforming, especially uh, the MDBs, you know, um, the multilateral development banks, and how, of course, they address the whole question of um, uh, availing resources, you know, for development in, in Africa. I think that was a good thing, although it was not clear exactly uh, the roadmap we are going to use in terms mm -hmm. of ensuring that actually these MDBs, you know, um, are follow suit and, and they're able to uh, really address some of those particular challenges. The question of debt was a big issue. That was seriously, you know, discussed. Mm -hmm. And I know the president was talking about, you know, a new, you know, uh, finance sort of architecture, you know, that is favorable for Africa. Because the continent, of course, has been borrowing, you know, uh, at a very, very high interest rate to the extent that um, we are borrowing at an interest rate that does not necessarily align with uh, our growth. You know, we realize we are, we are probably growing at a certain particular percentage, probably 5%, 4%. And then you end up taking a loan that is that you're paying about eight percent. So how do you expect you know to make the estimate, for example? So the question of you know debt restructuring, for example, mm -hmm. you know the question of um, uh, the issues of how um, uh, we can uh, countries can be given proper debt relief and so on and so forth are critical, critical issues uh, that um, uh, would actually make a lot of sense, you know, uh, to the continent. Because remember, we have been saying that the African governments have already been spending on adaptation. In fact, our investment in adaptation, knowingly or otherwise. It's actually five times more, really, than our budget for health, for example, in the continent of Africa, mm -hmm. meaning we are paying for adaptation through our health. In other words, um, the kind of debts uh, the African governments are already in makes, makes it very difficult for us to be able to address climate change because it doesn't leave us with disposable income that we cannot be able to invest in terms of addressing some of the challenges that are, are being experienced. Right now, we are staring at El Nino, which is coming. You know, how resilient our, our transport systems, for example, how resilient, you know, our, our um, say, you know, sewerage systems, you know, can they be able to withstand probably the impacts of, you know, El Nino so on and so forth, you know, and we have resources, you know, to invest in that. So when you're talking about countries that are seriously in debt and countries that are continually being bombarded by adverse impacts of climate change, you realize that uh, there is a, um, a great need to really reform how we finance the development, you know, in the continent uh, of Africa. Mm -hmm. But there were some issues that we felt that were not necessarily very well um, articulated. And one of them, of course, is um, the question of adaptation. We have been very, very, very uh, clear that adaptation remains a top, top priority for Africa. In fact, if you look uh, globally, the, and if you look at um, uh, what we call the adaptation gap report, it indicates that uh, the gap that we have for adaptation is actually 340 billion US dollar per year up to 2030. Now that is massive. 40 billion. That's it, globally. And mm -hmm. in Africa, it's actually more than 8 billion, what we actually need. But the total, of course, climate finance that we need in Africa by 2030 per year is about 277 billion. So there's a huge, huge gap. Right now, we are only discussing about doubling of adaptation finance from 20 billion to 40 billion by 2025. So that's a big joke. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we need, to, we need to be more decisive and uh, more focused, especially uh, from Africa. And we come up with a clear position that Africa needs adaptation perhaps much more than mitigation. And that we need to see much more focus, you know, a global focus on uh, adaptation uh, so that uh, then we're able to uh, uh, build the resilience of our people so that they can be able to withstand, you know, the shocks that come to the Im adverse impacts of climate change. So we did not necessarily have to appear like we are exonerating, you know, uh, the emitters and giving them, you know, a free ticket to continue emitting by saying that we have a common, you know, uh, obligation to address climate change, which is true. But the thing is, 
they must still remain responsible you know you know for um addressing this climate you know uh, a challenge you know especially in terms of financing and availing the resources that are, are needed because it's clear and it's now common knowledge that africa contributes the least to the emissions but we're suffering most and therefore the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities must stand and therefore even as we think about doing business in the climate space it must not you know go against that particular principle that whoever has done more in terms of the emissions must therefore contribute more in terms of addressing uh, the climate change, uh, challenge so that is one of the areas that we feel that was not very well addressed just transition is a critical topic mm -hmm. and, 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 and even before we move to just transition and I like the fact that you're quoting um, you know the report of uh, the intergovernmental uh, uh, panel on climate change uh, which and, and the conversation and, and, and that report you know came out prominently during the conversation and one of the issues that was highlighted and was captured in the Nairobi declaration was um, the fact that uh, you know the world is of course off track in achieving the 1.5 uh, percent uh, 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 climate change uh, 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 degree Celsius on, on on climate change, and uh, you know there is a there is a call to do more to ensure that this is achieved and and and, and the african leaders you know are very categorical that the developed economies they need to do more yeah. to reduce their green gas emission mm. which is hitting uh, uh the ozone layer uh, beyond that what else can they do apart from raising that concern mm -hmm. well i want to give an analogy uh, brian um if you have a pipe that is freaking and you're only concentrating in wiping the water on mm -hmm. the floor you might continue doing that until Jesus comes back. As you continue wiping the it's water... It's a zero-sum game. Exactly. So you must think about uh, rectifying, you know, whatever is ha happening within that particular pipe. You know, mm -hmm. you have to uh, actually um, repair that particular pipe. And that is really an issue that is very, very, very urgent. Because even as we continue supporting Africa to adapt and other regions to, you know, to adapt, mitigation remains a big, 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 big issue. Uh, but mitigation makes a lot of sense where the emissions are coming from 96 percent of the emissions are coming from the developed world the developed economies although we have also been saying that they also have the, finan the financial muscle to address this particular challenge and uh statistics has it data has it that we need to reduce our emissions actually by 43 percent by 2030. that is, that is about the seven years mm -hmm. if we are to maintain the 1.5 degree target we don't want to hit beyond 1.5 because of the impacts. You can imagine now we're at 1.1, but the impact, impacts are already, you know, being felt everywhere. So if we go beyond that 1.5, scientists are telling us that for sure, we are probably going to stay at a situation where we have climate change that is irreversible. Now you can imagine where we'll be headed. But you see where, where we'll be headed. But now, this 43%, even if Africa casts the emissions 100%, which is about 4%, mm -hmm we can only account for a very small percentage. Yeah. So we need to see more ambitious NDCs, nationally determined contributions uh, from the high emitters. As it starts now, Africa has NDCs. In fact, the revised NDCs are so way ambitious compared to what is in the north. So we are getting to see more ambition where we probably should not be seeing that ambition. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing less of that, you know, a commitment from where that should happen. And therefore the call by the African readers, because it's clear on that declaration that they are calling the developed country partners to actually come up with uh, you know methodologies and, and and clear plans on how to reduce the, the emissions significantly because even if we continue doing whatever we are doing until we address that leakage until we address that particular uh, 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 source of these emissions uh, will be uh, and we'll not be doing much but unfortunately in the conversations at COP that has not been forthcoming and we don't see that commitment and that remains a big 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 issue because that is a game changer reducing emissions from where they're coming from significantly that would actually uh, save the world mm -hmm. and and one of the issues that was um uh, floated is uh, the fact that uh, you know when you look at the african continent it holds some of the world's largest sources of renewable energy you're talking about sun you're talking about wind you're talking about hydro hydro power and when you look at the investment in renewable energies in Africa, it's about uh, 60 billion U.S. dollars, you know, out of the more than 3 trillion U.S. dollars invested in green, in, in green energy. And, and, and so there was a call that uh, we need to deepen this. But do we have strategies on how this can be deepened, this investment can be deepened? Because it is one issue to have 
the renewable energy sources. But it's also another issue, tapping investment to uh, renewable energy sources. That's a very good question. And, and, and um, of course, we take pride in the fact that uh, we have the, all these natural resources. You know, like you mentioned, Sora, we have sometimes 12, sometimes even more than 12, you know, uh, uh, hours of, of sunshine, which is different from the north. Uh, we have not even expected 10% of our Jidama potential, for example, in mm -hmm. Kenya. Uh, um, we could argue Kenya is doing very well, of course, in terms of uh, investment in uh, renewable energy and clean energy sources, yep. uh, which is a good thing, uh, but we're only scratching the surface. And remember, if you look at the, the African continent, actually about half of the population has got no access to energy, whether it's data or clean energy. Yeah. We don't have that access. 600 million, 600 people, million people are actually in darkness. You know, out of the 1.2 billion. Out of people. the 1.2 billion. So mm -hmm. that's about half you know, of our population. Very well. They don't even have access to this particular energy. Mangi, I want you to hold your thoughts on that mm -hmm. because uh, that information you know, is, is baffling. I mean, you know, for a continent this big and with so much resources. I mean, the question, you, you know, that, that information is baffling. Before, because we just now want to go to the uh, Kenya School of Government where the... Uh, a chief of staff and uh, the head of public service is currently meeting um, he was having a consultative meeting with ministries, departments and government agencies. Let's first of all listen in to the head of public service uh, Felix Koske who is on the podium. That he has given three options. So 